Wine Industry Network's 2024 Bold Prediction Series is presented by Heffernan Insurance Brokers, with supporting sponsors Protea Financial, Turntine Brokerage, and American Ag Credit. Thank you for your support. Hi, Liz Bishop and Deborah Costa here from Heffernan Insurance Brokers, and we are your fire mitigation and insurance gurus. This wildfire structure protection unit is a unit that the British Columbia government has been utilizing for about 10 years. And in 2023, there were 500 structures that were saved by this unit. So it has proof of concept. Here today, we have Adam Iveson from Ember Defense to share with you a few important notes about this structure. So this is a structure protection unit. This has everything on board to be self-sufficient. This has pumps, sprinklers, hose lays, bladders, everything to be off the grid to protect your property ahead of an oncoming wildfire. Liz and I, in partnership with Ember Defense, are committed to protecting your winery property. Just think, if everyone invested in a wildfire protection unit, together we could ensure that wineries don't burn and make insurance affordable again. Text WASP DEMO to 707-789-3062 for a free demo on your property. Hey everyone, George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to another edition of our Bold Predictions webinar series. Uh, we've got a really good one for you today. It's titled Wine Advocates Push Back on Anti-Alcohol Movement. And of course, it's no surprise that uh, as an industry, we're certainly facing some headwinds, but the efforts of the neo-prohibitionists and some of the information that they're pushing out certainly isn't helping. And, uh, and if there's one thing that I took away from as this session was coming together, the one thing we shouldn't be doing is sitting back and just waiting for it to blow over. That's the wrong answer. There are things that we as an industry can do to push back. And really that's what this session is all about. So I think you're going to really enjoy it. I really enjoyed uh, watching it come together and uh, I think you will as well. So our panel is great. We've got Gino Colangelo, who's the president of Colangelo and Partners. And Gino's going to present some really interesting consumer data that they recently did. Uh, he's going to be joined by Dave Parker, who's the president of Benchmark Wine Group. Dave's going to present some data uh, around wine being part of a healthy lifestyle. They're going to be joined by Shyla Salmon. Shyla is the senior vice president for Jackson Family Wines, and she's going to share some really interesting initiatives that uh, Jackson Family has going on uh, with regard to connecting with younger consumers. Uh, really good stuff, and, uh, and obviously it's very successful. And last but certainly not least, we've got Karen McNeil, who is the author of The Wine Bible. She's the editor of Wine Speed, and Karen's going to talk about an industry-wide initiative that she is leading along with a few partners. And it's something, it's called Come Over October. I'm not going to get into all the details, I'm going to let Karen get into that, but it's called Come Over October, and it's something that not only should every retailer, wine retailer uh, in the country get behind, but every winery should get behind uh, come over October as well. And it's something that they should be a part of. And I think if we can collectively do that, we can move the needle. So I think you're gonna enjoy that. Let's see, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, we pre-record these a couple of days in advance. We do that for quality purposes, but we also do it to allow for as much engagement as possible. So as you're watching the presentation, so are our presenters, and they're gonna be monitoring the chat room. So if you have questions that come to you, you don't need to wait till the end of the presentation. Go ahead and type those questions in and our speakers will do their best to pick those off as they come in. Now, that being said, we are not going to get to every question that was submitted. We had so many questions that that came in during the registration process. You might remember that there was an opportunity to do that. Um, it would have made for a two or three hour session. So we've already scheduled Wine Advocates Push Back Part Two, which is the Q&A section uh, basically of this session. And that's going to be scheduled for September 18th. You'll see a link in the chat. We'll send you an email, but definitely sign up for that. That's where you're going to see our speakers get into a, a bit more detail as they as they take on all the questions that came in. So keep an eye out for that. I want to thank our sponsors. It's We've got terrific sponsors that we work with, and those sponsors are what allows us to continue to put these educational webinars online for free. Uh, so beginning with our series presenting sponsor, it's Heffernan Insurance Brokers. They're a great organization. We've been working with Heffernan for years. Thank you for your support. Uh, and they're going to be joined by our series supporting sponsors. We've got Protea Financial, Wine Accountants, Turrentine Wine Brokerage, and American Ag Credit. 
all three of these companies are just great supporters of our industry and um, and they're good friends of ours so thank you for your support obviously i want to thank everyone for watching if you enjoyed today's webinar click the like uh, click the little bell so you can get notifications of when we have future webinars uh, as they're being released uh, you'll get notified of that as well all right i think that about covers it uh, again thank you to our sponsors thank you for taking the time to be with us Thank you to our speakers, and uh, I think I'll hand it off to Gino and let Gino take it from here. Thanks very much, George, and thanks, uh, Wine Industry Network, for this opportunity. As George said, we have a fantastic panel today. Uh, we have uh, Shyla Salmon, who is the Vice President of Marketing at uh, Jackson Family Wines, and who will talk about all the great things Jackson Family is doing to engage young consumers in wine. We have Dave Parker from Benchmark Wine Group, who will talk about some of the challenges along with me are presented by uh, anti-alcohol forces and what Benchmark Wine Group as a leader in online sales is, is doing uh, to advocate for wine. And we have Karen McNeil, um, the foremost writer on wine in the United States, who will talk about specifically a campaign that Karen conceived and is now going uh, full swing with the support of many in the industry, including Jackson Family and, uh, and Benchmark. So I'm Gino Colangelo. I'm president of Colangelo & Partners. We are a wine-focused public relations agency. Um, we are a group of 75 people who love wine, drink wine, advocate for wine, talk about wine. And wine is really uh, essential to our livelihoods and, and to our lives. Um, about a year ago, I started uh, reading a lot of negativity about alcohol generally and wine specifically in the press and start to get concerned. Uh, wine is my livelihood and it is my passion. And I had many conversations with many people in the industry from producers to importers to wine trade organizations to journalists to figure out what was happening and how we can respond. And um, then in December, I commissioned some research with John Gillespie and Wine Opinions to get some hard data behind our concern. And I'm gonna I'm gonna share now um, just a, a snapshot of that research. Uh, and this research, this full research, is available to anybody who would like it to reach out to me. So uh, part of our research was about dry January and sober October. And we saw these really concerning numbers that 64% of 21 to 39 year olds either have participated or plan to participate in dry January and or sober October. And I did the math, my math isn't great, but I can figure out that two months out of 12 is 17% of a calendar year. And that's a lot of time for people not to be drinking any alcohol, uh, specifically wine, uh, for our interest. So that number was very concerning. And again, 21 to 39 year olds. And just to preface this research, this was 2000 consumers who already drink wine. This was not a general population. So we're talking about 2000 consumers who are already wine drinkers at some level, either uh, frequent or, or uh, occasional. Um, and this number of 64% among that cohort, which is the cohort we all talk about all the time, right? 21 to 39, um, Gen Z and young millennial. Next. Okay, so the... Um, information we were reading in the press, the news we were starting to see from driven by the WHO, uh, looking at Canada guidelines, switching to two drinks a week instead of two drinks a day, Ireland switching to, you know, uh, labeling for wine being uh, essentially uh, the same as what tobacco was years ago in terms of warning levels. Um, so how does that impact consumers' uh, perception of health? Well, look at this slide. Over 40% of 21 to 39 year olds are concerned about health at one glass of wine per day. That's pretty extraordinary to me because from, I'm 64 years old and for my whole life, I've heard two drinks a day for a man and one drink a day for a woman, right? We've all grown up with that or those of us of my age. 
And now young people are going to be uh, starting to worry at one glass a day or even less. And that's an alarming statistic because that impacts long-term uh, consumption. Changes in dietary guidelines. We all know that there are there's currently in Congress a uh, discussion about changing the dietary guideline <clears throat> and possibly following the Canadian guideline of two drinks a week. So if you look at this slide, 21 to 39 year old, again, we have over 60% would uh, consider adopting new guideline, cut down uh, based on the guideline and give con or give consideration based on the new guideline. So again, if I'm 25 years old and I get conditioned uh, that two drinks a week is the maximum amount of consumption for safe drinking or safe consumption of wine, I'm looking at a lifetime of reduced consumption that could impact uh, you know, the business in, in, in really dramatic ways if young people really buy into these, to these new guidelines. And our research suggests that uh, it's likely they will. So uh, based on this research, had many more conversations, had a conversation with Karen McNeil, uh, and Karen came back with a big idea that she will address later, but uh, for a campaign to advocate for wine with positive messaging. And um, we created a company exactly for that, to advocate for wine with positive attributes. We're not arguing health, we're arguing about the positive um, impact of wine on our lives and on, on people's lives. So with, I'll let Karen speak more to that. Uh, she will finish today's uh, presentations. Dave will speak next, and then and Shiloh will follow Dave. So Dave Parker, founder and uh, CEO of Benchmark Wine Group, will talk about uh, some of the threats from the health perspective and some of that anti-alcohol lobbying. Um, Dave, uh, if you want to please take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Gino. Uh, it's very interesting, the stats that you presented. Uh, one of them that you showed me is how few people think of, of wine as heart healthy. I grew up uh, watching shows like uh, the famous 60 Minutes episode uh, where it drove home the, the value of, of, of wine with respect to heart health. I'll show you a little clip just toward the end here. Yet, if you go to, to the north in France, there is not that much olive oil. They're using more there butter no and cream. Oil, of course. And not. yet the rates are still lower there. Now, why are, why are the rates in, in Lille uh, lower than in, in Boston? Well, uh, my explanation is, of course, the consumption of alcohol. There has been for years the belief by doctors in many countries that alcohol, in particular red wine, reduces the risk of heart disease. Now it's been all but confirmed. The wine apparently affects the platelets, the smallest of the blood cells. It is platelets that cause blood to clot. They prevent bleeding. But they also cling to rough, fatty deposits on the artery walls, clogging and finally blocking the artery and causing a heart attack. The wine has a flushing effect. It removes platelets from the artery wall. So the answer to the riddle, the explanation of the paradox, may lie in this inviting glass. When that uh, show came out, uh, you could not buy red wine uh, at your local shop. The consumption went up so high. Um, what's interesting um. is that that message is is fading, and I also, besides running Benchmark Wine Group, I head up the National Association of Wine Retailers. Uh, we're very restricted on what we can say with respect to positive uh, uh, aspects of alcohol through a TTB ruling. Uh, we have to essentially prove it. So I have a data company, and we decided that before we could talk any further, we would work on that, that technical analysis. Uh, the standards that are out there are the so-called meta-studies, uh, the meta-studies that are published by the NA NIH, National Institute of Health, are viewed as the goldest of the gold standard. And uh, they're published in a form that looks like this. This would show a large number of different studies, one per line, and the overall results, both in terms of numbers, that number 
in the first column there uh, indicates a, a chance of the disease relative to, to control, which would be a control in this case would be a teetotaler. Uh, where the number is less than one, it essentially shows a reduced chance of these, these ailments. This slide is coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease. And the chart shows the same data with the arrow, error bars uh, to the left of the uh, control line, that dark black line. And you'll see that all of these studies virtually, with the exception of two of them, demonstrated uh, that the, the chance of getting coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease, and the third chart is death, is mortality, are all dramatically reduced uh, th through uh, consumption of alcohol. Uh, this slide is not really specific for quantity, but it's also quite often visualized in the chart like this. Uh, the blue bar is, cardio, uh, is heart disease, second bar is vascular disease, third one is stroke, uh, and you see here for you know, consumption of different levels of alcohol. Uh, normal drink is about uh, 13 grams, so the first chart shows you the the effect of uh, minor consumption, the second one up to about a drink, drink and a half, the third one up to about two drinks uh, and so forth, three drinks, four drinks, and up to five drinks in the, in the last slide. But in every case, you'll see heart disease is significantly lower, cardiovascular disease significantly lower. And here you do see some negative effects of high consumption rates in this case for stroke. But these are the kind of, this is the data that we took a look at. Uh, and, and in fact, it confirms what, what uh, 60 Minutes said in terms of the reduction of heart, heart disease. And there have been thousands of these studies. Um, recently, the World Health Organization came out with a statement that no amount of alcohol consumption is safe. And uh, although it's a little hard to read, what they're saying is that uh, alcohol is known to cause cancer. Cancer is the largest killer in the EU, and therefore uh, all levels of alcohol are bad. Although they mention there in the green, there are there are positive effects for heart disease uh, and and for uh, uh, diabetes. As a matter of fact, they brush over that and say sort of ignore the man behind the curtain because this uh, alcohol creates a higher level of cancer. Uh, it's always bad, uh, which is an extreme statement. Uh, this was forced upon The Lancet, which is the national health magazine of Great Britain. They were forced to publish it. They didn't want to. So we thought we'd look at that data. So we looked at diabetes. Uh, this is in a chart form. Same thing, one being teetotaler. And you can see that the the average uh, uh, chance of, of mortality from diabetes comes down with, with several drinks. First chart is for women, uh, which is more pronounced. And for men, it's also a little bit lower than one for moderate drinks. And then it goes up, which is not terribly surprising. We'll see that with more of our data. Um, then we took a look at cancer, which is what the WHO addressed directly. There are lots of different kinds of cancer. Um, and some of them, in fact, are reduced by alcohol consumption. Interestingly enough, melanoma, uh, kidney cancer, and several go down. But preponderance, uh, they do go up. So the WHO is ac accurate in that regard, especially breast cancer and liver cancer for women and oral phary pharynx cancer for men are the, are the, are the highest risks. Um, but taken together with uh, heart disease and diabetes, what we had to do was take a weighting factor on those chances that I just displayed. And we took the average chance of a person dying of a particular ailment, as you see, you can see here, those are in those orange columns from, they're different for women and men. Uh, as you can see, heart disease uh, is, a, is a major killer, killing 22 to 24% of people. If you take the percent chance of reduction from the, the previous meta studies that I showed you, multiply them by that as a weighting factor, you get some pretty substantial reductions in overall chance of death uh, from heart, heart attacks uh, and cardiovascular disease from one to two and three to four drinks. Um, and the 
the effect is even there at higher levels, levels that might be very unhealthy for other diseases. Diabetes also is, chances are reduced, and it's a substantial killer of people. And we take the various cancers, uh, and we lung cancer being the biggest killer of, of all of the cancers, uh, and we take each of them, we multiply them by the the increase or decrease uh, chances based on alcohol consumption, and we get these other ones. And I highlighted the the, the, the biggest uh, negatives for women in pink and, and for men in blue, but the yellows in general are, are negative on this chart, and the greens are a positive health effect on this chart. When you sum them up, you get a classic J curve where one to two drinks, even three to four drinks, all things considered, thinking about heart attack, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, you still, you're still ahead uh, only when you get up to this five to seven level. Uh, is it pretty clear that uh, the, the higher level of cancer takes over and your, your chances go down? Um, the Lancet said the same thing and the same issue that they were forced to publish, the WHO uh, uh, statement, they came back and said that many studies show that low or moderate amounts of alcohol, especially red wine, can reduce, car reduce cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and even death. It's exactly what our data showed. Um, they also mentioned that dire warnings about alcohol and cancer have the potential to be ignored by many people as undesirable and unattainable. Uh, people just flat out stop listening to the moderation method and do it, uh, uh, moderation message and do what they want. It's also important to put the results of these studies in the context of absolute levels of risk uh, versus relative risk associated with alcohol intake, which is actually generally quite small. Um, and in fact, if you look at all the causes of cancer in Europe, of all the things that have been proven to, to, to increase your chance of cancer, alcohol is actually the lowest. Smoking, not surprisingly, is the highest, but second worst is your choice of diet. Uh, estrogen, primarily birth control pills, is a major uh, influencer, as is infection. Diseases like HPV are, are known to, to cause cancer. Uh, so Alcohol in the bigger picture of what can cause cancer in, in Europe or in the world is actually tiny. Um, and then again, you have to weigh it against the positive effects to heart, for heart disease and diabetes. Uh, this is the guy, Raymond Pearl, that originally came up with the positive message on alcohol, the expectation of life, moderate drinkers, uh, is higher at all ages in the expectation of life of abstainers. So he created the famous J-curve that shows your chance of dying uh, as a teetotaler, if we call that one, and it comes down to about 80%. So it's down about 20% with one drink, two drinks. And then we see it go back up above one with a high, high consumption of alcohol. Women go up faster because of breast cancer. Uh, they lack a, as much of an enzyme that breaks down alcohol as men have, and they tend to have lower body weight. But the, the macro message of Living longer, all things considered, is still supported by science. Uh, one of the major killers that is also influenced by alcohol is Alzheimer's. Surprisingly, it's uh, surprisingly valuable against Alzheimer's. One to two glasses of wine a day uh, through various meta studies have been shown to reduce Alzheimer's by 45%. And three to four, which is starting to get up into some pretty substantial consumption, actually brings it down 75% and brings dementia down uh, about 83%. That was a real eye-opener for me. Uh, and we can get you all of these links so you can look at all these studies. Um, now we take, there are other things that are affected by um, alcohol we don't have time to talk about. Kidney disease goes way down. A uh, level of suicide, interestingly enough, which is a relatively big killer, uh, goes down for small consumptions of alcohol. It's probably the social aspect of it. And the lack of social contact these days is a, is a serious disease. If you take every single cause of death, uh, the substantial cause of death, look at whether it's modified by alcohol, add all of those up, you get the same J-curve number where one to two drinks gives you the best positive effect, all things considered. Clearly heart disease comes down, clearly cancer goes up, 
most everything else goes down with the exception of liver disease, uh, which is not surprising does go up. Uh, by the time you get to three to four drinks, there's still a modest positive effect, all things considered. And as you get up to five to seven, then you start to see the negative effects would be these types of analyses that we would need to put any type of positive message into the market. Uh, pretty unequivocally, if the government is publishing these as their, their body basis of fact, uh, could be used to sustain a message if we were to put that out. Uh, now, Dave, uh, Dave, can I ask if this data, your presentation, will be available for viewers? Yes, we'll, we'll put this out. Uh, it comes with a caveat. Uh, the TTB regulations require that any time a positive message or the quoting of a positive, a positive uh, reports go out, a uh, uh, disclaimer go out along with them. But we will put, we will make those available. We'll make the links available to them as well as our our summaries. In terms of why there's a ne negative message out there. Um, there is an organization called the International Organization of Good Templars, or IOGT, that goes back to 1851. They were explicitly an anti-alcohol group. They've morphed into Movendi, which is an, a worldwide organization in 62 countries. And Movendi is taking huge quantities of dollars to, to promote uh, a, a pure... Uh, prohibition uh, on alcohol. And uh, they're ones that influence WHO. Uh, they've taken uh, the data and stood it on its head. Uh, this is Tim Stockwell, who works for him. He used to be a, 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 an alcohol analyst that uh, brought forward messages very much like the one I just gave you, because that's what the data supports. Once they hired him, he went through and took a look at the 2,500 uh, uh, studies on alcohol. He immediately discarded about 90% of them because they didn't show what he wanted them to show. He then distilled them down to exactly five, which are here. And you'll see even of those five, three are essentially neutral. That's, that's that uh, neutral line, uh, that one line that I was showing before, only two of them out of the 2,500 that he could find showed negative correlation between modest, moderate consumptions of alcohol and, uh, and health. And so he used those two and averaged those two to say all alcohol is bad. Now, that's, that's the worst form of of non-science to cherry pick that, that much data and only, and only display what uh, what you feel is carries the message that you're being paid to to create. Uh, he is partners with a gentleman named Tim Naimi, uh, who gets himself on a lot of boards, including the board that uh, uh, came up with the, the the dramatic reduction in Canada. As it turns out, although it's been widely published publicized that they have reduced their recommended recommended level of alcohol to two drinks a week. Turns out the the government in Canada rejected that study as non-scientific and, and holds to their current level, which is three drinks per man per day and two for women. That's still the official regulations on the books. However, uh, Mr. Naimi and many of the other people on the Canadian board and other prohibitionists have been put on the panel to study um, the, the up to, uh, the up to date uh, health guidelines, and so we're very worried that they'll uh, go in in a similar direction to the one that was announced in Canada. So, uh, as the National Association of Wine Retailers and as a, a a wine wholesaler and distributor, we're looking at how we can take forward the message, and we're happy to be working with Come Together and some of the other groups in, in that endeavor. Dave, thanks a million. This data is fascinating and it's uh, illuminating. Uh, I just want to mention there is a book called The Very Good News About Wine that is very digestible, very readable. There it is. Shaila has it. Um, I would encourage uh, all, all the viewers of today's webinar to look into getting that book as well as uh, getting Dave's research. But here, you know, I'm not a research guy. It's a little dense for me. But 
Um, Dave explained it really well. And um, so that's kind of the scary part <laughs> of today's webinar. And now we're gonna get to the positive actions that the industry is taking. First with Shyla from the producer standpoint, Jackson family is a leader in wine uh, in terms of making great wine and also in terms of marketing wine really well. Nobody better than Shyla to talk about that. So Shyla, do you wanna take it away? Thank you, Gina, for the introduction. I think we're, to clarify, kind of talking about two things. One is wine and health. And the thing that Jackson family is addressing the most is the health of the wine industry. So as a supplier, we can't talk about wine and health. We can't make any of those claims. But what we're most concerned about is the negative headlines right now that are actually in some ways maybe sabotaging our own industry that this negativity in the headlines is not always backed up by facts and that there's a lot more nuance to the story. And so how I wanna look at this presentation is going beyond the headlines a little bit, showing you guys what the work that we're doing and then pointing to the opportunity in wine. So we know there's this looming um, FDA possible changes, but in the meantime, we need to make sure that our industry stays healthy and competitive, competitive amongst other beverage alcohol, competitive against cannabis, um, just competitive in the way that the wine industry has always been to continue to grow share. So the goal of Beyond the Headlines is a strategy that we've created and worked on to combat the negative perceptions around the health of our business and to collaborate with our partners, our suppliers, media, trade, and regional organizations to put together initiatives to ampl amplify our positive narratives. We've met with the WSWA, with most regional organizations around California and Oregon. We've met with um, most larger media outlets. Um, we have presented to a lot of folks this presentation in depth, and I'm gonna give you guys just a very small version of it. But the big headline here is that, we say this internally all the time, headlines used to sell newspapers, but now headlines are the news. And so what's happening is that people are just reading the headlines and assuming the story underneath and not digging deeper into the story. We're also finding that a lot of the data that is being shared is very one-sided and is not giving the deeper part of the story, digging into the categories, into varieties. And so we're gonna do a little bit of that. And also really thinking about our consumer and what is our consumer actually doing and where are the opportunities in that and what is the hard work the wine industry has to do to keep bringing consumers into our business. This is just a little bit of the work we've done the last few months. Um, we've met with all of these media outlets and really tried to help them form more positive stories and seeding stories that they can then dig into with our other partners to help change that narrative. The concern with the narrative right now is that it is amongst our own industry. We're all feeling it. We felt it from you guys and the questions you asked before this webinar, but we're concerned that consumers are gonna feel it. And once consumers think wine isn't cool, it can start to actually become that. And so we don't wanna sabotage our own business. And so we need to be really conscious with what we're putting out there. So this is the biggest story here and I have all the data to support this, but if you look at the dollar number from 2018 to 2023, and this has been 166 data, the wine industry is up 46%. It's gone from a $73 billion industry to $107 billion industry. That growth is very, very healthy. And you can see the weight between domestics and imports. And if you look at cases, the same data from 2018 to 2023, so shows a decline. And so the cases is all that's getting the news right now. And I think we need to shift how we talk about our own business. So I've been in the industry for 20 years. I've been with Jackson Family for 13, Constellation for seven before that. And we always have been talking about premiumization. Premiumization has been at every conference we've been to. All of us have been talking about it. Mergers and acquisitions have gone in that way. Now it's happened. And we're a little surprised as an industry that we're seeing it. But premiumization has always meant that we're, there's more dollars and there are less cases. And so I think this is just the actual story of what's going on. And so I think we need to shift the narrative and how we talk about the health of our business. Most industries talk about dollars, fashion, cars, beauty. They don't talk about individual units. Also, when you look at our category growth, if you look at, this is um, IWSR related. If you look at the categories $10 and above, 
since 2017 to 2023, we have very healthy growth in all of those categories, all the way up to the plus 50. And where we see the decline is in the sub 10 category. This is also a look at IRI. This is from just a few weeks ago in June. And if you look at that middle bar that's highlighted in red, that's the eight to $11 category, which all shows decline. But if you look at the 11 plus up to 25 plus category, and we're looking at just traditional varieties here, Cab, Chardonnay, Sauv Blanc, Pinot, Pinot Grigio, Merlot, most of those categories are either flat or showing very healthy growth. And so this is where we need to start looking and focusing our energy. And this is just another indicator of premiumization. Another thing in the headlines is a lot of this talk about vineyards being ripped out. Um, and there are a lot of reasons that there are changes in vineyards and I'm just gonna highlight a few of them, but of course, a lot of you know these and there's a very nuanced story. But I think overall, what we need to think about is where are these vineyards being ripped out and why? So some of the experts we've talked about, talked to, have talked about the fact that a lot of these vines are actually old, that they're decades old and it's time for them to be ripped out and replanted. There's also a shift in competition from lower priced imports to into domestic. And so that's causing some of those vineyards to be ripped out. And then the areas that those vineyards are coming out are in Modesto, the Central Valley, places where it's more competitive with different crops and maybe crops are being turned from grapes into other crops that are more profitable. The other thing we keep hearing is that consumption is going down. And this is a chart that shows 1995 to 2021. And in Europe, consumption has gone down 15%, and that's due to a lot of factors. But if you look at the United States, consumption of wine has gone up 58% since 1995. And so sometimes with this data, we need to step back and look at a more macro trend versus just the last few years and behaviors that probably came out of COVID that are just right-sizing to where they should have been, but we had that blip that was a few years of a little more intake of wine. The other positive news here is that the OIV expects in 2023 that we're gonna get supply back in equilibrium globally. And so we're not gonna have this oversupply position. I think there has been oversupply in the past with imports, we've had some larger harvests, but knowing that overall, we are already starting to get a little bit back into equilibrium. Another way that we've been looking at this is in regards to consumption of alcohol. And so in 1960, 62% of Americans consumed alcohol. And in 2023, 62% of Americans consumed alcohol. And so what this is showing is that there have always been dips and valley, valleys in consumption of alcohol here in this country. If you look at that big dip in the 80s, that was the whole Mothers Against Drunk Driving movement. We compare that to possibly what's going to happen now with this Neho Prohibitionist movement, that it's going to decline again. But it always is good to step back and say that it's always going in both ways. What is shifting is the amount of volume of alcohol that individuals are drinking. And that's something we're gonna address with on the marketing side and also ties into selling less cases, but better cases. When you look at total alcohol consumption in the United States, this is directly to one of your guys' questions. Um, this is total spirits, wine and beer over the years. And wine is 16% of the alcohol, beverage alcohol consumed in the United States. And so knowing that when people do choose to drink less alcohol, it's not always just wine, that we are also having these other categories that have heavy alcohol consumption. And maybe some of those will also go down as well. All that burden will not have to be just on our smaller category. So with all the negative headlines about um, generations and generational consumption, we wanted to really peel back just the facts. And so what this chart shows is really eye-opening, I think, for everybody on this call, which is it shows if somebody was 21 to 24 in the year 2010, and then in 2023, they're 34 to 37, it shows their participation rate in the wine category. And so what you see as you move across the slide is that as people get older, they come into the wine category more and their peak participation is between ages 38 and 47. And we have seen this for the last two decades. And so that change is not, even though the headlines are saying young people aren't participating, young people have not ever been heavy participators in the wine category. They come in with age, they come in with time, they come in with wealth. 
And wine is a pretty expensive beverage when it comes to cost per ounce. And it's also more of an occasion-based beverage. And so we have to make sure that we keep talking to these younger consumers to bring them into our category as they mo move up and move through. This next slide shows by generation, the share of spend by price point. And the part on the far right, I think is the most interesting for this group. And what it shows is that Gen X, millennials, and a small amount of Gen Zs are 59% of the wine that's drunk at the 20 plus category. And so this shows a lot of health. Yes, we see boomers are very heavy in the total wine category at 46% up there on the left, but we're definitely seeing our younger generations participating in our higher end wine category. And if we dig in a little deeper, if we look at the folks that we're actually targeting in the fine wine business, if we look at them by generation, they're an 80,000 K plus household, they're college educated and they are eco-conscious, so they care about sustainability. When you look at those categories 10 plus, you see even higher engagement by Gen X, millennials and Gen Z. So with the 20 plus, they become 71% of our category. So to me and to us, that shows health, as long as we keep talking to these folks about wine and why they should be engaged. The last part on the data front, before I get into some really fun solutions for all of us, um, is looking at what consumers say versus what they do. So a lot of in the data, it's survey data that you see in headlines. And survey data doesn't always tell the truth. So this is a source that we use that's called Numerator. We get information from 90,000 receipts. And this compares 2019 all the way to 2023. And what we see in that comparison is that versus 2019, people are buying $324 on average year in the wine category, which is up from 2019, and that they are buying more often wine than they did in 2019 as well. And so both of those metrics show health, and that is actual receipt data. So the fun part of this conversation, which I'm just gonna give you a top level, but is just distilling how do we meet consumers where they are right now? And how do we talk to new consumers? How do we get people more engaged in our category? How do we get them to trade up? How do we bring them in? And how do we do this by generation? And so a couple opportunities, one, share this data, share this with your teams, Use it for brainstorms, use it when you're working on your annual plans, and also share it with your distributors because we need to make sure that we're talking about the health of this industry constantly and the opportunity within it. The next one is very important to this younger generation is being sustainability driven and being authentic in that. So greenwashing, everybody is very, very hypersensitive to greenwashing. So make sure when you make these claims about what you're doing with the land, what you're doing in the vineyard, what you're doing with your winemaking, they are authentic and true. And if you cannot make them, do not. Um, consumers will see beyond it and they will call you out on it. Um, so making sure that you're telling the real story of what's going on in your vineyards through your wineries. Another thing that we know is very important to this younger generation is health and wellness. And so we need to make sure that we're transparent about this. If you think about all the products that younger generations are buying in the grocery store, they have ingredients. Even often water says gluten-free on it and vegan. Everything they buy says what's in it and wine does not. And so we're not arguing that we need ingredient labeling on wine, but we do need to tell people that there's not a bunch of additives in our products and what is actually in the product. Right now, we just did a wellness survey and 48% of consumers believe that wine has more sugar than other alcoholic beverages. And we know that this is absolutely not true. It's just because we don't talk about sugar and calories on our packages. And there have been some wine companies that have made claims about sugar in wine and they have really stuck with consumers in their messaging. And so we need to counter that very clearly. You guys can see our Murphy Good label down there on the right and our Copan label where we've put ingredients. We've also put no artificial flavors, no added sugar and no artificial coloring. And so that's just some examples of things we're trying to put on back labels. The other opportunity for you guys is digital marketing. We need to be competing with the seltzers, with spirits and with beer and make sure that we're keeping our edge in the digital space and bringing people into our category and also working with influencers. You guys had some questions about influencers. We find a lot of value in influencers as spokespeople in the wine space. And there are also um, ways that you guys can do commission-based programs with influencers so you can directly see the value. So if you invest with an influencer, you can set up a commission program where they make a dollar amount off the wine that's sold. And so that is really an easy way for you to measure ROI. 
As a wine category, we need to make sure we bring in diverse audiences that we're talking to multicultural folks around the country, that we're talking to LGBTQ plus audiences, inviting them into our space. If you look on the right there, that is a campaign, Saluda La Vida. It was a campaign we did, uh, we ran in Chicago. It was done um, in Spanish and in English and also in Spanglish, which we found out through working with our local teams in Chicago. And it was promoting Latin cuisines. And this is um, something we had a lot of success with and we'll be rolling it out nationally. We all know that Mexican food is the most eaten cuisine in the United States. And so making sure that we're talking about cuisines and things that are actually in people's daily lives when we're talking about wine. And then when it comes to LGBTQ plus messaging, we need to make sure that we're not rainbow washing, that we're actually speaking to that audience and engaging. Um, as Jackson Family Wines and La Crema, we participate in 12 Pride Festivals around the country each year and talk to this audience in an authentic way. We also work on political action groups and donating money to ensure that rights are protected. So for us, we're telling the authentic story about the values of our company, which ties into the next point. The other thing for wine messaging is to make sure that we're speaking in simple terms and using less pretension. We have heard often from our research that wine has been seen as an exclusive beverage, not an inclusive beverage. And so making sure that we're inviting people even through language into our space. Experiential is very important events. I will tell everybody, get beyond the traditional wine events, go where other wineries are not and put wine in front of people where you can engage in an authentic way, give them a moment to taste, but we can't all keep talking to the same people at the same events around the country. Partnerships are very important. This is the big one that we're doing. We just announced our official partnership with the NBA and the WNBA, as you see up there on the right. This is a four and a half year partnership that we've just rolled out. And the goal of this is really to reach a young, more diverse audience and tell them that wine is to be drunk in high energy occasions. We've heard that wine is known as a low energy occasion beverage. And we wanna make sure that wine is associated with fun and all your occasions, whether you're at a game, whether you're at a watch party, and then also tacking on to the WNBA right now and just the, the energy around this league and what they're doing and what these women are doing and really standing on the values of women in sports and what that means to this country. So we feel really good with this partnership but I think we have kind of a throwdown to other wineries to get in there and try to find new creative partnerships. Um, and you don't always have to have all the money. I think there's a lot of value wine has. And so having the product as the value, not just the cash, because as we know in wine, we are cash low, um, but we do have a very high value product. Meet consumers where they are, be scrappy, be inventive, have fun. I think that's my throwdown to the wine industry is get back on your horse, let's get competitive again and make sure people are coming into our space. And then last, I just wanna end on transparent wellness and better for you related terms that in wine, if you're speaking in a legal and factual way, there are ways that we can talk about this to relate to this audience, talking about the fact that we're plant-based, that we're natural, that we're sustainably farmed, that we are sometimes regeneratively farmed, that we have organic grapes, biodynamic, that we are most often vegan, that we are often gluten-free, that sometimes we have zero sugar, that we have no sugar added, which is actually not legal in California, that we're made with 100% grapes, no artificial colors, no artificial additives. These are terms that were legal and factual with your wines you should be using when we're talking to our younger consumers and ensuring that they know that there's nothing hiding behind that label. Shyla, thank you so much. That um, was really inspiring. It was informative and it's actionable. Uh, that's exactly what the wine industry needs. Leadership uh, like that we see from Jackson Family Wines. And, um, and and we love the messaging and we love the the sort of the guidance. And, um, and now we're going to go to Karen McNeil uh, to further the actionable advice and uh, engagement that we as the wine community need with consumers. So Karen. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen McNeil. I'm the author of the Wine Bible and I have a, a small wine communications business based in uh, Napa Valley. So Shyla and Dave's uh, presentations were, were so terrific, um, but I'm left with the feeling of either being somewhat demoralized on the one hand by, by bad or inaccurate news or just exhausted on the other hand, because it seems like there is so much work 
to do. And so if you're feeling this way, I get it. I, I feel it too. But as a journalist, I think that there are critical storylines, really important messages that the wine industry can tell and has uh, not yet sufficiently told. So I'd like to tell you now about um, a project called Come Over October. So this project, Come Over October, began in January of last year when I did a video called Why I Hate Dry January. And um, it got, much to my surprise, uh, 17,000 responses and shares and lots and lots of commentary. And the first response was from a sommelier at a very, very famous restaurant who said, you know, Karen, I love the wine Bible, but you have this completely wrong. People should take a break from wine. And I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, this is a sommelier from a very famous restaurant. And uh, the conversation sort of flew uh, as conversations can on Instagram. And at the end, I said, you know, I understand the idea that everybody should do what is right for their own body. I'm a woman. I get that idea. But I have um, three objections. One is that somehow the narrative around wine has devolved to a conversation about alcohol. And to me, wine is more than alcohol. Wine is culture and it's history and it's art and it's religion and it's spirituality. Wine is woven into a much larger, wonderful tapestry. Two was that the, the conversation around Dry January had begun to take on a sort of self-righteous tone, which I think is very misplaced. And three, what about wine's 9,000 year history? as a beverage that brings people together. We know that wine has played that role, that we've all been in circumstances where we didn't know someone, but after sharing some wine, we are now friends with that person. Wine has societal and cultural value in that regard, especially in an age of social isolation and loneliness. And why wasn't that story being told? So one morning walking the dog as I was kind of grumbling to myself about why the wine industry didn't do that, didn't tell that story better, I said to myself, you're a word person, you should tell that story. And so popped into my head the idea for a nationwide month-long campaign called Come Over October. And very simply, you would every wine drinker um, in the country would invite a neighbor, a friend, a colleague, um, a, a family member to just come over and share some wine, come over to a house, come over to your home, come over to a winery, come over to a restaurant, just come over and share some wine in honor of wine's long history as the beverage that brings us together. No talk about medicine, no talk about health studies, no talk about any of those things, just sort of rising above that fractious, you know, study versus study and, and go back to something that we know to be true and authentic about wine as a beverage that is communal, that brings people together. So it was early in the morning, I called Gino and said, so I just had this idea. And it's either like a really bad idea or it's a pretty good idea. And I, I need someone who really understands communications to tell me. And he said, I think it's a really good idea. And then we called Kimberly Charles, um, and who also like Gino owns her own marketing and communications and PR company and said, what do you think about this idea? And she said, ooh, this is a really good idea. It's simple and it's very positive. And it's something that the wine industry can execute at all levels from importers to retailers, to trade groups, right down to um, consumers in every part of America. 
And so to flash forward now to the present, uh, Gino Kimberly and I formed a mission-driven uh, company called Come Together, a community for wine. And that company, uh, to which, by the way, we, the three of us are donating all of our time, that company has launched the Come Over October campaign. We have a Come Over October website. We have a digital campaign. We have assets that wineries, trade groups, and retailers uh, can use posters, logos, table tents, all kinds of uh, assets that can be used free of charge. And at this point, we have um, a remarkable, we only went live with this story um, uh, about four weeks ago, and we have a remarkable um, group of supporters, some of whom are amplifying the message and others of whom have also contributed financially to help us really make this a reality. Jackson Family Wines is one of our patrons, Jay Lore, Total Wine um, and more. We talked to yesterday, uh, excuse me, two days ago and have plans for their 800 plus stores across the country to do come over October uh, events and tastings. Gary's and wine.com, buy right, lots of retailers are, um, are in on this idea. Lots of wineries are. Pardon me, Gino? Benchmark Wine Group. Yes, Benchmark Wine Group. Sorry, Dave. Yes, Dave, Dave was one of our original supporters as well. We have about $50,000 in donated media. Um, I'm in the media. Uh, and so, um, and Gino and Kimberly are as well from a different uh, side. And so we kind of got people to donate some really solid media uh, for us. So I invite all of you to join us, whether you are a very tiny little winery or in any aspect of the wine business um, from small wineries, and small retailers to the to the largest ones, it's really easy to launch your own Come Over October event. Um, and above all, I hope you will follow us on Instagram at Come Over October. And if you'd like more information about how you can, uh, some ideas for joining the campaign or how you can help us amplify the message, we are very simply at www.comeoveroctober.com. So join us. We need your help. Thanks, Karen. And I just would like to add, for those who, are, who have the resources, financial support is great. But really what we're looking for is amplification. So as Karen said, from the smallest winery to the largest, everybody can engage with us, follow us on social, utilize our assets, launch your own creative ways to uh, execute a come over October promotion in your tasting rooms, through your mailing lists. There's just so many ways to amplify our campaign. And most um, wonderfully and interesting of all, we have press conferences coming up uh, and everyone on this uh, who is watching this webinar is invited to any one of these. In the Bay Area, we have a press conference coming up October 8th, August 8th. Uh, at Joseph Phelps Vineyards in New York on September 23rd at a location to be determined. So we invite you to help us amplify this very positive message of wine's historic role as a positive force in culture and society, the, the beverage that more than any other beverage brings people together. Gino, I hand it back to you. I, I do want to also mention very exciting news. Just yesterday, Lyft came on board as a supporter of Come Over October. And Lyft is the perfect partner because um, if you come over my house for a glass of wine and it becomes two or three, well, take Lyft home. Uh, and um, the support for the campaign has just been overwhelming from wine enthusiasts to vine pair to, I mean, media companies, um, organizations, importers, of course, producers like Jackson Family and Jaylor and Joseph Phelps and others. 
the the response has been overwhelming and um and a bit hard to keep up with right Cam? <laughs> <laughs> but um yes. so there's so many ways the wine industry can engage shyla outlined many practical inspirational ways to get involved karen and uh, myself and kimberly with our campaign come over for october very easy to engage with us co-brand with us take our assets i like to call this open source software we're creating the assets the messaging the graphics take it use it adapt it within reason right um and and let's promote what we love about wine uh the sociability the the culture the history uh, uh, i can match count for eloquency but um yes so that that's our uh that's our webinar for today uh, we love the engagement. We love that we got so many questions ahead of time. We love the signups. We, we hope people take away something actionable and positive, but with a dose of realism about, you know, the challenges we're facing. So thank you again to Wine Industry Network, to George, uh, Christy, and um, we look forward to more conversations about how we could promote and celebrate wine. Thank you.